in a town, but it's actually a village. It's one of the smallest towns in Germany. And I live at the uh, outside, you know, where you have a lot of green. And I am a geek. And there, you know, people feel like I'm a geek. And it's nice to be here because here are, everyone here is a geek. And so here I really feel at home. My talk is about marketing is for geeks. And assuming that I am or perhaps was a geek once, uh, I think I can really talk about this topic and know it well. If you have any questions or want to contact me later, then please feel free to ping me on Twitter. So before we delve into the marketing side of my talk, what actually is a geek? And here we are talking about a special species. It's the developer geek. You know, there are other geeks and nerds on this planet. And this is one of the geeks that uh, we could rarely shoot a picture in the wild, you know. You, you cannot really find them because they hide in buildings and in front of computers and so on. So we did an analysis of how they live, you know. So we found it's definitely a mammal. And this mammal builds its microhabitat with this technology stuff, computers, how they call them. And the interesting thing is that they try to change their inner working, you know. Either they change the hard drive, for example, or the software. And then they can sit long hours, so something must have happened in this area from an evolutionary perspective. And they really drink and eat very little. They can sit in front of their microhabitat for hours and then no, don't really need to drink or eat a lot. Then we found that it seems they are sensitive to light. They always have the curtains down. But we are not sure yet that might also be to protect their microhabitat and to better interact with it, because perhaps the light is a problem for the screens. We need to analyze that a bit more. So something interesting happened to this geek. There was an evolution with this species. And here we have what we call the Geekus programicus. And then something happened this species branched. And first, there's the Geekus entrepreneurius. I guess you know this is Monty Widenius. You know, he started as a geek, now he's a millionaire. I think $16 million a euro, that's what he uh, won from Sun buying MySQL. And then there are these management geeks, like this nice guy with a ponytail. And he actually made it happen that Sun bought his company. So how did this branching happen? And we are not yet really sure, but we believe that the main food that the Geekus Programmicus ate was pizza. And there must have been one or perhaps more of these geeks who said, well, I'm fed up with pizza. Let's go out and eat something else. So they went out and they had to start interacting with a social environment that was new for them. And we believe that they went for sushi and this is where the whole thing started, you know, where these geeks really became, um, they were able to interact with other social, with human beings that are not geeks. And today we have the Geekus Economicus who can, in the open source world, combine freedom, being a geek, looking like a geek, with being commercial, you know. This person, Richard Starmer, he says nothing is wrong about making money with free software. OK, so this Geekus Economicus, he has some new goals. The goal that they always had was do what you love, love what you do, program, develop software. But the new goal <laughs> is earn a living with what you love to do. And to pursue these goals, you need to develop new skills. This is actually commercial open source. That's what we will talk about. And these skills are sales and marketing. And this talk is about marketing and specifically open source marketing. So let's start with the marketing part of my talk, the 101 for Joomla geeks. I'll explain it in your words. We need to extend the class geek. We talk about the Joomla community and the main functions we want to talk about methods is how can you raise visibility for your business that is related to Joomla and how can you generate leads? How can you make money with what you're doing within the Joomla community? 
So let's first take a look at the Joomla business ecosystem. There's the Joomla project in the center of it all, and you have individuals that interact within the business ecosystem. You also have companies such as system integrators or creative agencies, web agencies, and you have the copyright holder, which is Open Source Matters Incorporated. Contrast that with a vendor-centric open source business ecosystem, such as MySQL, for example, before it was bought by Oracle. There's the vendor in the middle, and then all the other actors within that business ecosystem evolve around this vendor. It's a very centric model, while the Joomla model is very decentralized. So now that we understand the business ecosystem, what are the opportunities you have within that Joomla business ecosystem to uh, offer a product or a service? What should the business model look like? And there is a great analyst company, the 451 Group, who did a tremendous job with uh, um, displaying these uh, elements of an open source business strategy, and that was a talk provided by Matthew Essel at the Open Source Business Conference this year. So what you see here, the main areas of your open source business model are the copyright control, of course, who owns the copyright. Can you actually see one? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the end user licensing, what kind of license do you choose? The revenue triggers, how do you actually make money? What are they going to purchase from you, your target audience? And the software license, you know, is it reciprocal, uh, like the GPL, or is it a permissive license, like BSD license? And the development model, is it a closed development model, or do you, with your extension, Joomla extension, for example, also provide a community infrastructure for others to um, also collaborate with you on developing your offering. So let's play a bit with these elements. Let's look at the copyright control. <coughs> so clearly the Joomla project is the foundation model. There is Open Source Matters Incorporated who own the copyright. And you, starting your Joomla business, you're a vendor of a product, for example, of an extension. Of course, you could also provide a service you could also, if you wanted to, set up a foundation as well with other Joomla businesses and then provide services or a product with a certain license. The distributed model is where various entities have the copyright of different parts of a code, of an extension, for example, and withheld. I'm not really sure what uh, Matt meant with that. Perhaps it's simply that you don't know who owns the copyright, you know. So, need to check that. Let's then look at the end user licensing. Dual licensing would be an option for Open Source Matters Incorporated because it owns the copyright of the code. Does it own it fully, actually, the full Joomla code? Because to do dual licensing, you need to really own the full copyright. No, you no. don't. Okay. OSM is uh, an uh, aggregate uh, copyright holder. So they, uh -huh. they uh, commit themselves to defending any uh, uh, violations of that copyright mm -hmm. in the name of all those people. Okay. So There's a new CLA now, a contributor's license agreement, which again, just primary points of in case just that. Well, you know, it, it's going to be different because then. Uh, it's not really, it's not from the get the moment that's uh, as far as I understand, only Microsoft signed but no one else. No, so there's more that, or as it was, it was, it was made a couple of months, there was, there was a discussion about but there was no need to get into it. Check in general, this, this CUI should be a public thing, but it's basically the legal thing from what you just said. Well, so, not exactly because you can also actually transfer copyrights to OSM. Okay. Okay. I understand the principle, so I think we don't need to discuss any detail. Also, I doubt that the camera will record the discussion because you don't have a mic. I don't, do we have a handheld mic? Okay. So as a situation okay. Today, it's That's interesting. So the main question is, do contributors 
through the CLA, the Compute Contributor Licensing Agreement, assign the copyright to open source matters, or do they keep it on their own, or is it they, they keep it? Okay, then the dual licensing option is not available to open source matters because there are too many copyright holders. It's not feasible. So we need to actually skip that. Of course, you could do that with your project. You know, it's GPL license, so you could decide, I also provide it under GPL license and I provide it under a kind of proprietary license. Then it becomes tricky for you as well because you need to make sure that the GPL, the viral aspect of the GPL doesn't apply to your code. So if you do something with SOAP interfaces, for example, that's a gray area, then you don't really interact with the GPL code, then you could use a proprietary license and do this to a licensing model. But in the Joomla community, it's a tricky thing to do that. Then open core, that's, we could look at the Joomla project as the open core of what you provide. So on top of the Joomla project, you could provide, a, a, let's say, an intranet for uh, the automotive industry or whatsoever. So you could create a vertical industry project on top of that, make it a package, you know, where you say Joomla is the open core and I built the rest around it, which is either proprietary <coughs> or licensed whatsoever. <coughs> the open complement, that's uh, actually what Microsoft does. You know, they have proprietary pro uh, products and they invite open source projects to, for example, build an open source project that runs on Windows. So the question is whether this is an open source business model, you know, but this is what open complement means. You could do that as well, you know, you could have a proprietary product and you can say, and now you can build something with Joomla on top of that or together with that. Single open source, that's definitely what Joomla is. It's one open source package, that's it, GPL. You download it, you use it. You could do this as well. There are many extensions that are GPL or LGPL. And assembled open source, that's when you take various open source pieces and I guess that's most of you, what most of you do when they develop extensions like Ajax libraries, for example, that you use third party libraries. And then closed, that's what we already discussed in relation to the dual licensing model. So let's uh, play with some of the co with one of the combinations. You are the vendor, and you say my project will be proprietary. It will be closed source. Of course, that's what I said before. You need to be very careful because the GPL is viral. If you want to really do it, it's of course perfectly legal, perfectly fine, as long as you don't uh, do anything wrong with the GPL code. But that's the one extreme side. The other one would be, of course, that you go the single open source model route. We'll look into these open source business model elements later again. But for now, we have a broad idea about which options you have when you set up your open source business within the Joomla business commu community. Let's look at what kind of conversations happen within this business ecosystem because we talk about marketing, and you know that markets are conversations. That's what this uh, famous Clue Train manifesto says, and it's the basis of all um, marketing 2.0, web 2.0 style marketing, social media marketing, and so on. So it's important that we look at the conversations, and of course, individuals talk with each other, communicate with each other within that ecosystem. Then, of course, the businesses like system integrators communicate with their clients. Then you have the system integrators who communicate with individuals within the Joomla community because they have a special expertise and that system integrator asks, can you help us on that project perhaps? And then, of course, the businesses also talk with each other. There's a system integrator who needs a web agency, for example, who can develop a graphical user interface for a new extension that they develop for a customer and businesses communicate with open source matters with the CLA uh, is something we talked about sponsorship and so on and then we have of course individuals who communicate with open source matters and that's all within the Joomla community as you see there are clients who are outside the community you know they simply don't care they 
want to buy something from the businesses and you implement it and that's it for them. They will not join the community. But there are clients today who are actually interested in the community aspect as well. So they might have in-house developers, for example, and they check the software and they say, well, we think it's good. And then they contact a system integrator or a creative agency to help them implement the project. So there's also um, some interaction going on here. But it's important that you look at conversations as those that happen within the community and those that happen outside of it. Because some clients talk with each other outside of your ecosystem. And that's, of course, what you want. You want word of mouth marketing. You want one heavy customer to talk with another one in the same industry, for example. And then they come to you and say, can you also help us with a similar project? And then, of course, there is the press, the media. And your clients, they read certain magazines, for example, or online portals, news portals. And you, of course, want to be in the press that they read so that you get visibility, that they hear about you, what you can offer to them. Same goes for trade first. You want to be a trade first where you can meet your clients. And this is an important distinction because as a geek, as a developer, you understand this ecosystem very well, but you might have trouble understanding things outside of that. And this is where you can have a great effect from a marketing perspective and gain visibility with little financial investment, you know, simply by helping out in the forums, by developing an extension, offering it at the Joomla extension directory. But here, this is outreach. And this, you know, you need to invest in public relations, for example, which will cost you money. And that's important because here you can do an incremental approach. Here you really need to invest and need help from other people, usually. So we look at the market conversations. Let's look at the discipline of marketing communications. How do you use these um, conversations to raise visibility of your business and to generate leads? Obviously, there are the general channels we talked about, the press, weblogs, events, outside of the community, inside of the community, the forums, the extension directory, and so on. So simply make a list of all these channels that might be interesting for you. And then, of course, it becomes tricky for you because time and money is always a resource that is limited. And what we always suggest to our customers is that they pursue a kind of bubble-up communication approach, which allows you to build your marketing communications incrementally. So within your company, make sure that you have one, two, or three people who Twitter about what's happening, so that we at least your target audience gets the minimum information about what's going on. And then also when they interact in forums, for example, this is also, these are little pieces of information that you can later use, for example, to develop a weblog. If there is something in a forum discussion that was interesting, you know, and you want to sum it up and um, make a little summary of the solution, then you can blog about it, which gives you more visibility and perhaps also outside of the community. And on top of that, you can then make a kind of wiki entry, you know, that is uh, a documentation page in progress. And on top of that, you can develop a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, for um, those interested in your business and what you're offering. And here's this little gap, because these channels are somehow things that happen by themselves, because there are many people doing something. And then you simply do something on top of that. And this is where you start with, um, um, with the marketing conversations and not primarily the community relations. And a newsletter, for example, is a good example because this is where someone actively checks out what happened the last four weeks and then pulls together the information and creates this newsletter and sends it out. And the goal of the newsletter is, of course, customer retention, that those who already work with you or are interested in working with you 
are always up to date with what you offer and that's also a sales opportunity for you to say okay we have a new case study for example or we have a new version of our extension out and then you go further up you know you can create presentations on top of all these information pieces collateral like white papers uh, product brochures and so on and then public and analyst relations if you can hand a white paper to an analyst that's very helpful for example or uh, public relations once you created a product brochure you are forced to really well describe what your product can do you know in just two three or four sentences and that's how you pitch to journalists are there any questions so far is this helpful so far or okay good and when you think of marketing communications and raising visibility this is very important because as a vendor it's very easy or easier for you to raise visibility you know MySQL for example they were the ones creating the MySQL database period that's it and that database was used by businesses like or is still being used by business like Facebook Google and so on so journalists and analysts they simply have an interest in talking to that company but let's say you're just a little contributor to the MySQL code you know and it's really hard to contribute to a database of course then your visibility is really low because why should a journalist care about you you're not that important for the broad audience and also for that industry and somewhere in between there are the creative agencies and system integrators and this is now the tricky part as long as you are someone who only provides services you're not that interesting from a public relations or analyst relations perspective because there are so many companies providing services why should they care about you and then the only option you have is to come out with interesting case studies and to become a thought leader in your area so you say for example we developed uh, the new website for um, Siemens for example for, um, for this large company where you can what's a good example um, uh, I don't know okay Siemens is a good name so you can get some awareness with that and um, then you also need to make sure that with that case study you connect yourself as a thought leader let's say uh, now I really need an example Siemens is that website is about um, you enter the product code you know and you get information about um, how ecological that product is you know um, or like the what Nike and the iPod touch this Nike what's that uh, product you know where you go running and then um, it automatically transfers information to your iPod and then you can see it uh, on a website for example if you did that project that would be very interesting because then you could become a thought leader in that area and say well that kind of technology is interesting because it connects um, um, it provides this information to uh, uh, in sports you know to people who run and so on okay I'm talking myself into trouble with these examples but I hope you get the idea uh, what is a thought leader? a thought leader is someone like uh, a person who in his area um, has ideas and communicates them where others say that could be interesting that's something I like you know for example uh, if Steve Jobs in an interview about one year ago told that tablets will become more important in the next two to three years then everyone would say okay we need to develop a tablet before Apple actually does we know that most of them failed because the tablets were not that good but Steve Jobs is a thought leader you know because in his area consumer products he repeatedly showed that he is very good you can be a thought leader by saying something will not happen for example so when we do thought leader campaigns for our customers they usually say oh well you know I don't really know a lot in that topic and then we say well what's your opinion and they say I don't think this will happen then we say then say it because you can be pro or con you know you're still a thought leader you say this will never happen tablets will never 
gain any ground. And uh, the newspapers will lose, you know, they will be dead in five years. And even the tablets will not uh, rescue them. Then you're still a thought leader, you know? You just have a different uh, opinion. Did that answer your question? Okay, great. So, as a system integrator, for example, you could think about creating your own product or a Joomla extension, you know? Let's say over three to five years, you developed customer projects, individual projects, and then you say, well, we could take these parts and make it a generic product and offer that like uh, intranet, project management, combining document management and so on. Because you believe there are a lot of companies who need something like that. And then of course, for you as a service company, this is tricky because when you offer a product, you need to do upfront investments. First you need to build the business model, you need to be sure that it really works, it's a risk for you. And you need to create a website, for example. You need to invest in marketing. And all this upfront investment, you're not sure whether it pays out. But your services, you know, when a customer comes to you and says, well, can you please develop that for me? This is money you get almost immediately from them once you're done with the work, you know. But with products, it's a risk. And it's very hard to achieve, actually. So it's easier to start uh, with a new company, for example, developing that product if you're really sure you want to do it. Okay. Next is the go-to-market strategy. And there is this elephant that, or that snake that ate an elephant. And that's something that you will find in a book called Crossing the Chasm by Geoffrey Moore. It's a really great uh, high-tech marketing book. You should definitely read it. And what he says is that in the adoption of a product, there are different psychographic groups. The first one are the innovators. You know, they're crazy about everything new. These are the Apple fanboys, you know, for example. These are people who don't care whether something is absolutely stable or not. Everyone, or most people knew when the first iPhone came out that there will be bugs, you know, they didn't care. They simply wanted it and tried this new technology because it would revolutionize their working with others, their interaction with others. So here, the innovators and early adopters, they like the revolu revolutionary aspect of a product because it completely changes their work pro process, for example. But here, from that chasm, starting with the early majority, they don't want revolution, they want evolution. They don't want that product to completely change their work process, they want it to support it with new functionality. And this is tricky because the early adopters and innovators, you know, they read blogs and TechCrunch and that stuff and they like to hear about what's new there. And the early majority think of a CIO, you know, who sees, okay, we internally, we would need that kind of software. It's not out there in the market yet, but there is this small company who developed it and it's something they offer. Maybe we should invite them. And then you should not speak geek talk, you know. You should not speak about, ah, and this functionality, uh, we developed it with SOAP and uh, it's just great, you know, this is XML, you can, uh, this is fantastic functionality. You need to say, okay, our product saves you 30% of your time and your investment will pay out tenfold because blah, blah, blah. This is what they want to hear. So if you want to cross that chasm, you need to start thinking business benefits and not tech talk. When looking at open source business ecosystems, this is, I would say, the community area. This is how a community starts. Joomla, or back then it was Mambo, you know, version 001 alpha, whatever. There are these innovators who try it out. This is how a community starts. And then, to cross the chasm, you need this marketing approach. Either you invest in marketing, have other companies help you, or you do it yourself. If you know what to do at that point and how to approach your customers. Of course, you know, it's, no one knows your business better than you do. So a marketing agency such as ours, they will not um, completely change your business. We will ask you, what is it that your customers want? And if you cannot articulate that, in a way that we say, well, 
that's what your customer understands, then we will help you with formulating it so that your customer understands these benefits. We help you understand what your customers really want to hear. And as long as you can do that yourself, fine, that's just great. Okay, so we were already talking about business benefits. Let's talk a, a look at the messaging. First, let's go back to the business strategy um, graph here from 451 Group. Now, messaging is about how you put things, you know, how you communicate things. And let's assume you're the vendor and you provide a closed extension for Joomla. Then you could say, we are open source. There are many companies out there who don't offer open source code, but that proprietary code is on top of open source software and who pretend they are open source. There are open source companies who have a community edition, but when you call them and ask their sales personnel about the community edition, they go like, oh, forget about the community edition. It's, no, 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 you should use the enterprise edition. It costs you 12,000 bucks per year. It's much better. You know, they cannibalize on their own open source version and that's almost the same like being closed source, you know. So still they pretend they are open source. This is about marketing, it's messaging, you know. They want to use the benefit of the open source hype that is still out there and all the positive connotations like l no licensing costs and so on. Of course you could just as well say we don't care about open source because our customers don't care about it. What we offer is a solution that does its job, it solves your problems, that's it. And our customers don't care about open source. Perhaps because you are a first mover in that area, for example, then you can really, you don't need to um, use open source as a way to um, approach a market where you already have some proprietary market leaders. You know, you would be the first in that area, so why not being propriety and get the most money out of it, you know? It's perfectly legal. The other thing is, I hope this is a kind of, it goes into your head, because as I said before, it's really important. Think of business benefits. I have a case study later about Alex Jum, Kempkens Jumfish. He's not here now, so I can analyze that later. And then I'll talk about business benefits more. So lead generation is the next topic. Let's say this is your business. Let's assume you provide an extension for Joomla. Then, of course, you have that extension, that software, you have some marketing on top of it, and then you do some sales to approach your customers, to pitch in requests for proposals, whatsoever, you know. You meet them at the trade fair, and you offer product or services or both. And then you have hopefully paid projects with these customers, and this is where you can bring in partners like a creative agency, if you're a system integrator, to jointly develop, implement that project. And on the community level, that's what we already saw in the conversations, part of my presentation. There are blogs, mailing lists, forums, and so on, where you can join the conversation and also generate leads. There are, for example, companies out there who use open source components, you know, Apache open source software, their product itself is proprietary, but they generate leads from the components that they use. And some of those components, they might have actually developed them themselves. Because there are large companies who say, oh, well, I want to use uh, Apache Lucene as well. And then they see, okay, there is this core contributor to Apache Lucene, and we actually have a tricky problem here. Perhaps he can help us. And then they see, okay, he's a member of that company, that company can help us with that issue, and so on. And then by that way, you could perhaps also sell your product to them, not just that special expertise of that one person. So when we think of lead generation, we also need to think about what is called integrated marketing campaigns. And as you've seen before with the graph from Jeffrey Moore with the Kassan, don't think you need to do this all to have some successful marketing. Use this, you know, to take out some bits and pieces that you can implement quickly without a lot of investment. Or you say, we need to invest here, we need to 
get a public relations agency to help us with that. So integrated marketing campaigns. You start to reach out to your potential customers, to your target audience, through public relations, through viral marketing, guerrilla marketing. At this event, for example, you could do some guerrilla marketing, you know. You could uh, jump around as a bunny, you know, and have a logo of your company here and, I don't know, whatever. So that would also raise visibility. You do that customer outreach at events. You can do it through direct marketing, like uh, direct mailing through emails. Uh, some focused offers, you know, special offers, industry-specific offers, and of course, advertising. And with advertising, the saying goes that you build a brand through public relations and you keep the awareness through advertisement. So if you look back at Yahoo, you know, in the first two, three, four, five years, Yahoo was the same as the internet. And as interest in the internet rose, people and journalists were writing a lot about Yahoo because it equaled the internet. Then after three to five years, you know, that interest was gone because the internet was there. We knew everything about the internet. Why should we care? And this is when Yahoo started to invest in advertisements on TV, in magazines, and so on. And of course, the ratio of success, you know, is much lower in advertisement. You need to have advertisements 40, 60 times in a magazine until people really see this advertisement. It's a lot of money you can burn there. So the next step is marketing communications. So let's say you did a public relations campaign about a great customer, a case study, and a journalist said, well, yeah, I would like to write about it. Can you please get me in touch with that customer so I can interview their CIO, for example? And then he writes this nice article on that online portal, links to your website, and what's next, you know? Now you should provide a case study, for example, for download or on the website, plus a register for our webinar link, for example. And this is how you can get interested parties to provide their contact details to you. And so they will also join the webinar. You can present your expertise there and you can generate a lead that way. And the last part is the sales, the lead qualification. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Ah, with landing page, for example, let's say the new major release 3.0 of your extension is now available. Then we suggest that you make one page from that, could be on your website or a, a dedicated, under a dedicated domain, where you market that new product because in your press release, you would link to that landing page and this landing page is especially geared towards your target audience. So you provide links you know, to a webinar, for example, or you provide a video there that explains the new features in two minutes, for example. It's like an information hub where you enter your information about your product and then you provide different links for your target audience. And sales lead qualification, that's when you say how high is the probability, how high is the revenue perhaps, and so on. And then you decide, okay, do we want to go follow up with this potential customer or not? And hopefully you will also close the sale. And of course the sale will then again have an impact on your awareness raising work because if you gain a new case study, you can start it all again. Or if with a new customer you develop a new feature for your software, you know, you can promote version 2.1, 2.2, and so on. Okay, now let's look at the Joomfish project of Alex Kempkens. He's also a member of our uh, freelancer network, Init Marketing. We are, I think, 11 people now worldwide who help with open source marketing, public relations, marketing, community development, all the main areas. And um, Alex has developed this Joomfish project and you know what I do with new customers you know I look at the website and in five minutes I know how well is their marketing how good is the marketing strategy does the business model work because in these five minutes you know you really see it it's the first impression and if you have this analytical framework it's very easy 
So the Joomfish name, I like it because it relates to Joomla, but it's not Joomla in there. It, and fish, barbel fish, we all know that. So it's, it's a nice brand name. I usually hate product names that have, are related to another product or a programming language. You know, something like PHP My Admin is a horrible name or PHP CMS is also a horrible name. And the issue is that if someone asks you, do you know a good PHP CMS? And you say, yeah, PHP CMS. Then this person will say, yeah, I asked you for a PHP CMS. What is a good PHP CMS? You know, it's a really bad name, but Joomfish is a good name. I'm just analyzing your project, so this is some free marketing, free marketing advice. Do we actually have more time or? 15, okay. That should suffice. Okay, some free marketing advice for Alex. Then the tagline is also very interesting because it allows you to multilingual content manager. But if you're on emotional territory, how should they attack you? you know? And you can nicely build this brand about around that emotional territory and also relate your business benefits to it. It's not that common in B2B marketing. That's what we are doing here with software. It's very common in consumer marketing, of course. You don't see it with the large brands like Apple or Amazon. If you look at the history of the taglines they used in the beginning, Amazon had a tagline, the online bookstore, I think. Today there is no tagline because everyone knows Amazon. They don't need a tagline anymore. But in consumer marketing, there was this clear trend. Also, if you look at the Amazon history, from category style taglines to emotional territory taglines. And this trend will also come up in open source because just think about how many open source CMS are out there. And they need to differentiate themselves. And you will see this trend <coughs> happening. So next is the product pitch. What is this product about? That's also fine for me. The Joomla fish is your key for providing multilingual content to your uh, visitors and so on. That's OK. What I like is that you can download it. You can use it for free. You know, There's community adoption. There's an incentive to try it out. And this is the whole trick about open source. You know, The software is out there for download worldwide. Potentially, there are, everyone who has an internet access can download it and try it out. So these people can become self-qualifying leads for you. Usually, with, we have one customer whom we helped uh, going open source. They were proprietary. And then they decided we want to offer it as an open source software. And after three months, they realized we are not making more sales currently, but it's easier because the new leads, they download their software, they try it out, they call and they say, hey, you know what? We tried it out. It's great. Can you help us with this project? And the sales staff, you know, they didn't have to go there and convince them that this is a great project and the demo and so on. They become self-qualifying leads, your target audiences. And that's the great thing about this project. It's always a trade-off, you know. With proprietary software, you can make a hell of a lot of money if you get the adoption and the visibility. But you need to do that through public relations or like Yahoo or Microsoft, you are lucky, you know. You are the first mover in a new industry. If not, you know, you need to invest a lot of money and then open source becomes a good option because you have this grassroots bottom-up adoption. I would like to see the license there actually, Alex, what do you think? Because it was very hard for me to uh, find the license of Junefish. I had to Google for it. So perhaps here a little LGPL? GPL. Ah, good. So you should really put it there because <laughs> I thought it's LGPL. And this is the sales pitch. And this is a bit vague because only from that paragraph I couldn't really understand oh, what is it, you know? What are the business benefits? <laughs> it's not in there. It says become a club member. Okay, you know, I start thinking this is software. Or why should I? I want to play golf or whatsoever. Why should I become a club member? And it says, you are interested in PDF documentation of Joomfish core extension or some special plugins and extensions? Why, you know? This product simply 
I thought it's about multilingual content, translations, and so on. That's what I need. Why should I care about the rest? And this is where <coughs> business benefits come in really handy, where you say, if you like Joomfish, um, become a club member, and you can minimize the risk of updating because you will get, um, you will get, how do you say it on your website? You will get uh, ex uh, exclusive access to pre-release versions, for example. So minimize risk, that's the business benefit. And I think you should not say join now, you should have the pricing here, you know, three buttons, and it says 19 euro for X months and so on, because it's a sale, so simply say what it costs and have the pricing there. Okay. Then the business strategy, I hope I'm not uh, telling any secrets here, Alex. Um, so the vendor... I love business. I'm listening. Very interesting. <laughs> so the vendor is Think Network. So there is a company independent from that extension. The extension is called Joomfish and there's Think Network. And Joomfish itself is single open source. There is no dual licensing. It's GPL, as we heard. And the revenue trigger is subscription, so you can become this club member, you pay a yearly, monthly fee, whatsoever, and you get some other products and services, you know, some plugins, um, you get uh, documentation, and so on. Then the software license is uh, reciprocal, it's the GPL. And the development model, and that is nice, it's uh, vendor-centric, but it's also public. Everyone can join who wants to. And the good thing about this example is that open source projects always take off and are very strong in internationalization projects like Open Office, for example. Very quickly, there were people happy to help translating the GUI of Open Office. So these projects can very much benefit from a community approach. Okay, the channels it uses, it has a website. It has a standalone community, so you get conversation going within the community and get other people interested in it because the community, you know, they do word of mouth marketing for your projects at this conference, for example. Uh, one second, going back. And it's, of course, in the Joomla extensions directory, there's actually no public relations going on, but why? I mean, why should Alex invest in public relations? This is a kind of platform product, you simply use it as an extension for Joomla and it's something that you market to the community, to the Joomla community. Why should he reach out through public relations to a CIO at uh, BMW? He doesn't care about that. The web agencies care about it, system integrators and so on. And they are part of the Joomla community. And then Alex wrote some technical tutorials, books and so on. That allows him to build his reputation and get people aware about Joomfish by joining conversations that are Joomla related, so of a broader interest, generic. The go-to-market strategy of his project is interesting and it relates to the public relations uh, discussion. He approaches the Joomla community, so it's innovators and early adopters, but as the Joomla community was growing and keeps growing, there are more early um, people from the early majority also joining the community. You remember that conversations graph where some clients were outside and others were inside, like in-house developers. And this is how the Joomfish project benefits and can cross the chasm without a lot of marketing talk, so to say. Because as the community grows, the more early majority people will join it. Those who are risk aware, who want evolution and not revolution. But my mantra is put more benef business benefits in there because they are very critical to cross the chasm because they show that you understand the early majority. And actually, I didn't tell you this, this, is, this means where the money is, you know. Here you make little money and here you make a lot of money. And the laggards are actually those who are buy your product because everyone buys it, you know. They use the internet because everyone uses it. But they're 60-something or whatever, you know, 
three more years until they retire, why should they use the internet? But everyone does it, so they have to do it as well. And the lead generation is also interesting. There's the Joomfish project, or extension, and it's a product plus subscription, and that gives you a nice recurring and scalable revenue. Because as we know, <coughs> earning money with services means that you're always dependent on your customers. For quite some of our customers, uh, our marketing customers, who have a subscription model, sometimes also in combination with a dual licensing model, the subscription basically saved their ass during the recession. During, you know, at the end of 2000, uh, was it 2008 when Lehman Brothers? Mm. Oh, already a long time. Okay, so at the end of 2008, all open source companies I know they didn't have any new leads. There was no new revenue coming in. And you know, if all that you sell is services, what do you do? Because once your projects are done, there's nothing you can do. And those who sell a license or a subscription, well, they have this revenue, you know, it keeps coming and coming and they can survive this period. So the subscription or dual licensing model is very good to go through these hard periods. Of course, there are also customers for us who have a pure open source play and provide services only who make uh, tremendous money currently because due to the recession, you know, people were um, looking at open source, especially in large enterprises. This is a clear trend. Okay, let's continue with lead generation of Joomfish. One more minute. You? One more minute. Ah, okay. You had a question? Okay. <coughs> okay, I'm almost done anyway. So, the Joomfish project gets a lot of visibility from the Joomla project because it's in the extension directory and so on. And that is an open source community that basically is a global market for Joomfish. So by using, so to say, the Joomla community, Alex doesn't have to do any outreach globally, you know. It costs a lot of money to do PR in the US, in Europe, perhaps in Asia, whatsoever. And especially for a project that is about multilingual content, you know, the global market is essential. And the good thing is also the Joomfish project raises awareness of Think Network because people who get involved with the project, they know, okay, this was developed by Think Network, so Think Network must be a really good Joomla company. And Think Network provides services, so this means that there are even people approaching Think Network for services that might be not related to Joomfish at all. But they heard about Think Network due to the Joomfish project. So this is how, I'm not telling any secrets, right? This is just from looking at your website. Yes. <laughs> I guessed, yeah. So he has some nice recurring and scalable revenue, you know, that lets him sleep well during the night. And then he has this high margin consulting rates. Not, not sure if that, that's true, you know, but uh, that's what you try to achieve. So by productifying some generic functionality that he developed for customers, he could develop this lead generation model. And of course, the Joomla project itself also has an impact on Think Network because Alex as a person is also active within the project. Okay, that's it from my side.